in a previous video that I will link to in the description, I showed you how to derive the curve to Dirac equation. Now the name curve to Dirac equation is slightly incomplete, in that its only use isn't just to write the Dirac equation in a curved space. What you really should call it is the generally covariant Dirac equation. It's the Dirac equation expressed in an arbitrary metric. And because this curved Dirac equation is the Dirac equation written for an arbitrary metric, you can, of course, use it to write the flat Dirac equation in any arbitrary coordinate system you want. Now, this is a fantastic demonstration of the curved Dirac equation. First, because it shows you the exact procedure you go through for expressing the Dirac equation in any metric starting with the curved Dirac equation. And the second reason is that it gives you the flat Dirac equation, the most commonly used one, in many different coordinate systems, the most common 10 or orthogonal coordinate systems are the ones I'm going to use as an example here. So it sort of kills two birds with one stone, giving you a demonstration of the generally covariant or curved Dirac equation and showing you how to coordinate transform it at the same time. Now I've structured this video as follows. I picked spherical coordinates for the first of the 10 coordinate systems that I'm going to show you, and I've gone through that example quite slowly so that you can really see what's going on. And for the other nine examples, I go through it much faster because it's the same process as you'd use for any metric. So let's get to it. Let's start with spherical coordinates, the most common coordinate system to use the Dirac equation in outside of Cartesian coordinates. We have here the curved Dirac equation as I derived it in that previous video I was talking about. And here we're not going to use it in any curved space, as I was saying. We're just going to use this to get the flat space Dirac equation in different coordinates. As per my curved Dirac equation derivation video, we have this formula for the covariant derivative and this formula for the spin connection, and then these formulas defining the tetrad, as well as this one giving the curved gamma matrices, and this formula which gives matrices that are proportional to the generators of the Lorentz group. The Minkowski metric in Cartesian coordinates is this, and we're going to be changing to spherical coordinates, so we need the Minkowski metric in spherical coordinates, which is this, I've defined x0 as ct to shorten the notation, the definition of the tetrad given by these three formulas, and then these two metric tensors imply these values for the tetrad. We can then plug the tetrad into this formula for the spin connection, and we get these results for the spin connection. The tetrads for transforming from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates here are relatively simple, so the spin connections don't work out to be very complicated. Using these spin connections and this formula for the sigma matrices, we can then use this covariant derivative formula to write out the covariant derivatives of the spinner for this transformation to spherical coordinates and we have these results here for that. We can then substitute these covariant derivatives of the spinner field and these curved gamma matrices back into this formula for the curved Dirac equation and then multiply everything out and sum all the matrices to get this ultimately. Now I've used shorthand notation for the radial and polar angular differential operators just so that it actually fits in one line. Now this I think is a really pretty equation, the Dirac equation expressed explicitly in spherical coordinates. Let's move on to the next coordinate system. The next coordinate system is cylindrical coordinates. Let's write out the Dirac equation in cylindrical coordinates with this scheme. I'm going to go through this much faster for all subsequent nine coordinate systems since I went through the first case spherical coordinates so slowly and carefully to ensure you understood it. The process is the same for the rest, so I'm just going to speed through it, show you what's different, and that way you get what's interesting without your time being wasted. This is the metric for flat Minkowski space and cylindrical coordinates, and this being the Minkowski metric in Cartesian coordinates implies these values for the tetrad, and therefore these values for the curved gamma matrices, and these ones for the spin connection. We can plug the values for the spin connections and the sigma matrices into the covariant derivatives to get this result, and then we can plug the covariant derivatives and the curved gamma matrices back into the Dirac equation, and then do all the matrix algebra required to get it into one matrix applied to the spinner, so some multiplication and addition 
and ultimately we get this expression for the Dirac equation in cylindrical coordinates. Or to shorten things, I've defined this gorgeous R operator here. And remember, this is different than in a spherical case. I give you the definition of the operators in each case when I need to define them. Don't assume that because I'm using the same symbol in one case, it means the same thing in another case. With the Dirac equation in cylindrical coordinates done, let's now move on to the next coordinate system. The next coordinate system we're going to write the Dirac equation in is prolate spheroidal coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in prolate spheroidal coordinates. That implies this result here for the tetrads, where I've defined this chi quantity to shorten things up. The curved gamma matrices from that are therefore these. We can then plug the tetrads into the spin connection formula, and that gives this result for the spin connections. Using that to write out the covariant derivatives gives us this result. Then we can plug the covariant derivatives and the curved gamma matrices back into the Dirac equation do all the matrix summing and subtraction and multiplication ultimately gives us this, where I've defined these gorgeous differential operators right there, and these two functions here all to shorten it up so you can see what's going on easily. This is the curved Dirac equation in prolate spheroidal coordinates. Now I want to make one warning. The coordinates here are denoted mu and nu, but I'm also using mu and nu as indices. The reason why I thought it was okay to do that is because context makes it so easy to see what's going on. If you have the skills to know what's going on in a video like this, chances are that's not even something you're going to notice, let alone have a problem with. But anyway, the Dirac equation in prolate spheroidal coordinates. With prolate spheroidal coordinates done, let's now write the Dirac equation in oblate spheroidal coordinates. This is the metric for Minkowski space in oblate spheroidal coordinates. That implies these results for the tetrads, where again I'm defining a quantity chi to shorten things up. I'll do this repeatedly throughout many coordinate systems. Chi will not be the same across them. I define it however I need to to simplify things in the particular coordinate system that I'm talking about. These tetrads imply these results for the curved gamma matrices, and these results for the spin connections. We can then plug the spin connections into the covariant derivatives to get these covariant derivatives, and then we can plug the curved gamma matrices and the covariant derivatives into the Dirac equation, simplify it down, and we get these, where I've had to define this quantity, omega, to shorten things up, as well as these two gorgeous derivative operators. So this is the Dirac equation in oblate spheroidal coordinates. With oblate spheroidal coordinates done, let's write the Dirac equation in bipolar cylindrical coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in bipolar cylindrical coordinates, where I've defined this chi quantity to shorten things up. This metric implies these values for the tetrad and these curved gamma matrices, as well as these spin connection values. And we can plug the spin connection values into the covariant derivatives to get these covariant derivative values. Then we can plug the curved gamma matrices and the covariant derivatives into the Dirac equation, do the matrix addition, subtraction, and multiplication required to simplify it down, and ultimately we get this result for the Dirac equation in bipolar cylindrical coordinates, where I've had to define this function and this differential operator to keep things compact. So if you've ever wondered what the Dirac equation looked like in bipolar cylindrical coordinates, now you know. With bipolar cylindrical coordinates down, let's now handle elliptic cylindrical coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in elliptic cylindrical coordinates, which implies these values for the tetrads with this chi quantity defined like this. These tetrads imply these values for the curved gamma matrices, and the tetrads also imply these values for the spin connections. We can then plug the spin connections into the covariant derivatives and get these results for them. Then we can plug the curved gamma matrices and the covariant derivatives again into the Dirac equation and simplify down to get this beautiful result for the Dirac equation in elliptic cylindrical coordinates. Now actually I want to be clear, these daggers are complex conjugation. With the Dirac equation in elliptic cylindrical coordinates done, let's now write it in parabolic cylindrical coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in parabolic cylindrical coordinates. These are the tetrads implied by it, and from there we find these results for the curved gamma matrices, and these results for the spin connections. We can then plug the spin connections into the covariant derivatives, and we find these results for those covariant derivatives. Plugging in the curved gamma matrices and the covariant derivatives into the Dirac equation, defining these quantities here to shorten it, gives us this result for the Dirac equation in parabolic cylindrical coordinates, where again these daggers just mean complex conjugation, if that isn't clear.
With parabolic cylindrical coordinates done, let's now move to straight up parabolic coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in parabolic coordinates, which implies these values for the tetrads, where these values for the tetrads then imply these values for the curved gamma matrices and these results for the spin connections. The spin connections inserted back into the covariant derivatives gives us these results, and then we can plug the curved gamma matrices and the covariant derivatives again back into the Dirac equation to get this result for the Dirac equation in parabolic coordinates, where of course I've defined these differential operators and this function to shorten it up. And again, the dagger just means complex conjugation in this particular instance. With parabolic coordinates done, let's now do bispherical coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric in bispherical coordinates, which gives us these values for the tetrads, for the transition from Cartesian coordinates to bispherical spherical coordinates, and through them it gives these values for the curved gamma matrices and these ones for the spin connections. Of course, just to remind you all the formulas for these things I still have at the top of each one of these. Then we can plug the spin connections into the covariant derivatives and get these results. Then we can plug the covariant derivatives and the curved gamma matrices into the Dirac equation and simplify down with all that matrix math to get this result for the Dirac equation in bispherical coordinates, where I've defined this differential operator and this function here to shorten things up, and still again, dagger refers to complex conjugation in this particular instance. We have now done one of the most complicated coordinate systems that I planned on handling by spherical coordinates. There's a very similar related one that's also quite complicated called toroidal coordinates that we're going to do now as the last example of writing the Dirac equation in exotic orthogonal coordinate systems starting with the curved Dirac equation, even though we're not going to a curved metric. This is the Minkowski metric expressed in toroidal coordinates, and that implies these values for the tetrad, where I've defined chi like this here, and these values through that for the curved gamma matrices, and then these ones for the spin connection, again according to the same old formulas we've been using throughout, and then we can plug the spin connections in one more time to get the covariant derivatives, which work out to be these, then we can plug the covariant derivatives and the curved gamma matrices for the last time to get the Dirac equation in toroidal coordinates, where I've had to define this differential operator and this omega function, where, as usual, the dagger still refers to complex conjugation in this instance. So that is the Dirac equation in toroidal coordinates, the last coordinate system I'm doing as an example here. Hopefully these examples have been useful to you. So now you know how to use the curved Dirac equation, more properly called the generally covariate Dirac equation, to change coordinates on the Dirac equation, having seen 10 different examples of common orthogonal coordinate systems. I hope this helps elucidate how to use the curved Dirac equation, and I also hope this helps you understand how to perform general coordinate transformations on the Dirac equation. If you want to know the derivation of the curved Dirac equation, as I said at the beginning, I have a video on that linked to in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. D-Trick out.